It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Wisdom Wednesday presented by DraftKings. And we're getting the wisdom today from a guy that not once but twice ran NFL teams with the New York Jets and the Miami Dolphins. He's been on the show before. He does all kinds of stuff in the media now for ESPN and otherwise. And he's running the 33rd team, which is awesome. We'll dive into that momentarily. I'm talking with Mike Tannenbaum, of course, momentarily. Like I said, spread the word winner two days away at Ross Tucker NFL at Ross Tucker pod sponsor confirmation email winner. Keep them coming. We got Awesome sponsors, Warby Parker, LinkedIn, Ladder, AutoZone. Hit them up and then hit me up. YouTube shout out. You get like a 30 to 45 second video clip from me to anybody you want. I don't care. Just subscribe to YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL and make a comment. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. I uh, really looking forward to this. Been trying to get him on for the last couple of weeks, actually. A uh, big fan of his from his time in the NFL and even uh, our, our families talking to each other for a long night one night at the Super Bowl. Uh, we hung out, which was awesome. His name is Mike Tannenbaum, GM with the New York Jets for a long time. How many years were the GM there, Mike? Seven. Seven years is a long run. And then I don't remember what your title was with the Dolphins, but I know were you like team president? Uh, executive vice president of football operations. Okay. That's better than team president because team president has to worry about too many of the business stuff where e- EVP of football operations, you're really just in charge of the football, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, exactly. It's all ball. That's awesome. Absolutely awesome. So I got to ask you, I did a game – with the Dol- uh, a Dolphins game earlier in the year, Ravens. It was Thursday night, Ravens-Dolphins. I was talking to somebody on the Dolphins sideline. I don't remember who it was, and they actually introduced themselves to me, and we're talking, and he said, yeah, I know all about you and your shows. I listen. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Thank you. He's like, well, I kind of started that because Mike Tannenbaum used to have me um, transcribe your podcast, you know, especially you with Andrew Brent. I was like, Really? I, I mean, I knew, you know, Mike, I knew I knew you and I know, knew you listen every once in a while or when I was on Sirius, I just figured when you were driving to work or background music while you're, uh, I know a lot of guys in the league used to listen to NFL radio on Sirius. So, but I was very honored to hear that you transcribed the podcast. And uh, I guess I'm curious as to, to why and, and how that started. So uh, it was one of the things that uh, Coach Belichick used to have a staff do was like read books. Uh, and really just report on them and, um, or, you know, bring in certain like things that guys were learning. It was a little bit like before the podcast days. And, you know, there's a great saying, Ross, uh, the key to life is what you learn once you know it all. And when you sit in those positions, there's a lot that consumes your day and your time. That's really important conversation with a area scout, your owner, a beat reporter, whatever it may be, you try to watch tape, you know, you, you try to do your job and so much is happening and, you know, you're a guy that I've always respected, didn't always agree with. There were a couple of guys I think we saw differently, but um, you were one of the podcasts that I made sure that our staffs would summarize and I would read every week. And by the way, at the 33rd team, we still actually do that. We, we summarize podcasts and um, we just try to keep learning and get better. And you're one of the people that we try to do that with. Well, um, I'm honored. I'm flattered. That's That's really, really cool. Um, I, you know, I, I like learning too. It's funny, Mike, I don't know if I've said this on the podcast before. I don't really read books. I I used to say, I don't want to read a book. I want to read a magazine, magazine articles, but now it's so important to me, I guess, to read on what's current that I really only read the internet, you know, and that doesn't mean it's like cheaper information. It just means at any point, right, my <clears throat> web browsers, I'll have, you know, eight open web browsers and it's like different things I need to read. You know, Army has two kids come back from the transfer portal. I do the Army games, um, you know, Dane Brugler's two-round mock draft, 
how Penn State can replace. You know, it's just there's just like there's always stuff that I need to read right now that I don't really get a chance to read other stuff if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it's funny you say that. I'm actually one of my goals for this year was to get back into a little bit longer form and read more books consistently. So right now I'm reading a book called uh, Team of Rivals, and it's about Abe Lincoln's management style. And uh, as you may know, Abe Lincoln was a, a Republican. A lot of his cabinet was filled with Democrats, and a lot of his former rivals were in his cabinet. And obviously, there's a lot about slavery and how he abolished it. And you would just only imagine some of the hurdles that he was dealing with. And, um, you know, it'd be like if Donald Trump today was like the Secretary of State for Joe Biden. Like, as crazy as that sounds, that's what uh, Abe Lincoln would, would did. I'm still going through the book. It's very long. Um, but I do think it's really important, like, you know, at my job with ESPN, like to stay on top of trends and understand things. And um, I do wish I read more books. And, and that is one of my goals for the year. That's interesting. So for people that aren't familiar with the 33rd NFL team, I think maybe a year ago, How I don't know how long you've been doing it, but you were on a year ago. Maybe we talked about it. I know you guys are doing some really cool stuff. Um, but for my edification and for the, the listeners, what exactly are you trying to build there? And what are you guys doing so far? Yeah, so we're basically a football think tank. Everything we do is for free. Uh, you go to our website, 33rdteam.com. We have a free newsletter. Everything we do is completely free. And I fell into a space, Ross, of very smart graduate level students who, for example, one of our rock star students right now is a double major at the University of Michigan, math and physics, who happens to love football. And then we have a bunch of coaches and GMs between opportunities. So proudly, someone like Dan Quinn spent a whole bunch of time with us after Atlanta, before Dallas. Uh, guys like Bill Pulley and Joe Banner, Dirk Cutter, um, just on and on. We actually count we have over 512 years of experience. And those coaches and GMs want to stay current. And those uh, students, and we work with Columbia, Tulane, UMass, um, you know, not schools like Princeton. We try to keep things a little bit higher. And <laughs> what we try to do is um, pair like an intern with a coach if they want to do some more reports. Cause like when you leave a team, you don't always have the support. And then we realized that we have really interesting content. So like the last couple of weeks, Bill Pullian wrote an article about why did he hire Tony Dungy? You know, Joe Bata wrote an article of like, why they hire Andy Reid? Andy Reid wasn't even a play caller in green Bay when he got hired. Um, so we really try to bring people behind the curtain. Wade Phillips, John Fox are recent contributors as well. And um, we have a call once a week, which is incredible. Um, I always say the standard of our weekly call, Ross, is very simple. Make us smarter. And we have uh, incredible people um, that contribute. For example, we have somebody who is a world-class physicist who broke down like the power of a pass rusher between someone like TJ Watt and Miles Garrett and what kind of offensive alignment you would need to actually be able to defend that. And uh, we'll talk about how would you approach a player who's not vaccinated? Or we'll talk today about how did Dallas handle the last two minutes, not from a second guessing standpoint, but from a mechanic standpoint, what, what are you teaching? What are you installing? That is awesome. That, that, that is really, really cool. Um, a couple current things I wanted to get your take on. The Raiders firing Mike Mayock I, I guess what I always think is interesting, Mike, and you can appreciate this, is, you know, people want to say, oh, look how bad his first round picks were. But then they say, well, but he got Crosby in the fourth round or whatever. I guess my issue being in the media is I never know for sure who's making those calls. It makes it really hard to evaluate a general manager like Mike Mayock, because Gruden's the one that brought him in. Gruden had the huge contract. My guess, because usually it's like who was there first and who's making more money. My guess is that Gruden had the ultimate say or the final say on a lot of those things. So how do we properly evaluate the tenure of a guy like Mike Mayock with the Raiders as GM? not knowing how many decisions were really his. Ross, it's a totally fair point. And candidly, that happens to assistant coaches all the time, positively and negatively. Um, <clears throat> I'll make a couple of points. When I was the GM of the Jets, I had final say for seven years on everything. 
and yet I never would want to make a decision that Eric Mangini or Rex Ryan didn't agree with. And proudly, I could tell you that's why I have meaningful relationships with both those gentlemen um, to this day. In Miami, I didn't have final say. The final say was out of Adam Gase. And there was times we would agree and there was times we would disagree. But once you make a decision as an organization, you've got to move forward. And if the Raiders had won a Super Bowl, Ross, we would be sitting here and saying, Mike Mayock, that Super Bowl winning head coach, uh, GM, what a great job. Um, so he would have gotten more credit if they had won. But unfortunately, when they don't, those are things that happen. And unless you're the final decision maker in any organization, there is a vulnerability that's going to happen. Right, that's just the re- that's just what you're signing up for if you sign a contract where you don't have final say. Right, that's right. You know what I think is interesting about that is too. Uh, you know, I see where Max Crosby's come out and said he wants Bisaccia. Derek Carr said he wants Bisaccia. You know, my sense is Mike that Mark Davis probably wants to move on. But I feel like the way he's timed this, he's in a really tough spot now to hire someone else when the star players, both sides of the ball, are coming out saying they want the interim guy who just had success. I don't know what he could have done different, but I feel like Davis wants to move on, but I don't think he's going to be able to. I totally agree. You know what's interesting? What a great lesson. You know, one of the great privileges in my career was between the time of the Jets and Dolphins I represented Steve Kerr, did his deal with the Warriors. Steve had no, zero coaching experience. And by the way, after he signed a massive contract, first thing he did is he goes to Vegas to coach to make mistakes. And there's so much about Steve Kerr that's unbelievably inspiring. But the point I'm making is this. If I'm an NFL owner and I have an opening right now, I don't know if I hire Rich Bisaccia, but I take a half a step back and be like, you know what? Here's a man that was on no less a year ago, did a heck of a job, and who's the Rich Passaccia this year that maybe we're not thinking about? That's a really good point. A really good point. Because he's never been on anybody's list. And he did a great job. Um, what do you think, Mike, about um, when a team like the Vikings, the, G- uh, the Giants, whoever, when they have – to fill both the GM and the head coach. I'm going to guess that you're a little bit biased on this one and think that they should always hire the GM first and then the head coach, but maybe, maybe you'll surprise me. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, I saw Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick walk into the Jets in 97. The Jets had won one game in 96, 97. We won nine and 98. We were in the championship game. I saw Bill Belichick walk into the Patriots building and then year two in the Super Bowl, the day that Andy Reid walked into the building in Philly, they knew they struck gold. So my point is it's about getting the right people. And so much is made about chain of command and authority. And while it's important, it's way more important to get people that can scale leadership. And I got to tell you, like, Ross, there's a couple of people that are going to get jobs right now that I'm shocked by. And it's just amazing to me, like, how some people run these searches and how – they're really not thorough. They don't call people that they used to work with because who you are in life for us is how you treat people that can't help you. And it's just amazing. I see some of these names that are being floated or finalists for some jobs. I'm just shocked, shocked. And it's just amazing to me that how owners or people around them who are constantly making hiring choices don't take a half a step back and question even their process. Because if you don't change your process, you're not going to change the result. That's really interesting that you say that. Um, You know, I think it's interesting that they hire these search firms that ultimately, seemingly to me, end up with the same names everybody else is already talking about. I I don't know what the value is there unless they're doing the due diligence or whatever the background work that they need and they're paying for that, I guess. I I don't know. Are there... um, well, that's, that's a little disappointing, Ross, because if you go to the 3013.com, we had Chat Chatlos, a search firm person, write an article about what it's actually like to run a search firm and why he gets hired. So maybe I'll stop summarizing Ross Tucker's podcast until you read that article. 
<laughs> I mean, the doctrine of reciprocity. Look, I didn't go to Princeton. I went to UMass, but you know, like what's fair is fair. If I'm scratching your back, you should be scratching mine. <laughs> I get your emails, man. I read, to, I, well, I apparently you don't read stuff them, from your emails. You know, apparently you don't read them because you wouldn't know what a search firm does if you had read my email. <laughs> hey, um, are there head coach candidates, Mike, that really stand out to you right now? Yeah, are, are there guys absolutely. that just from your experience or uh, conversations you've had that you think, man, if I was in charge of one of these uh, coaching searches right now, I would really like that guy. Ross, this is easy for me. And here's why I was the assistant GM of the New York jets for five years. I became the GM. I had no idea what I'm getting myself into. And we won a lot early in my tenure. So I survived my own mistakes and got way more credit than I ever deserved. And after about 18 months, I felt like I really understood what the job was. I felt like I got a lot better at it. I would, from a coaching perspective, I would hugely benefit from other people's mistakes. And I'm going to be very specific here. Dan Quinn took a team to the Super Bowl. How in the world is he not one of the 32 best head coaches on the planet? Jim Caldwell, beyond reproach in Detroit. How do you know they made the right decision letting him go? Todd Bowles, look at the impact he's made on that defense in Tampa Bay. And I would look at those guys, Doug Peterson, the guys who won a Super Bowl. I've worked with Vance Joseph. I would go with somebody who's experienced. And when you talk about the Caldwells, the Petersons, the Quinns, the Vance Josephs, those guys, they're great dudes. They're smart. They're accomplished. And by the way, if we were running a team, Ross, why should we not benefit by another team's mistake? I think it's a good point, too. It's interesting. It seems like fans – Never like what they call a retread. They never want a guy like that because it's like, well, he, there's a reason why he got fired at the last place. When in reality, everybody eventually gets fired, it seems like. And you're taking a big risk with a, with a first-timer. It seems like everybody wants the first-timer, though. They want the 38-year-old or the 42-year-old, and they want to, like, find their guy, Mike. Yeah, so I would say, um, are you better today than you were three years ago at what you're doing now? Yeah. Yeah, so why, why is being a head coach any different? Like, I, I think sometimes we really overcomplicate things. Uh, and that's not to say there may not be some first-time head coaches that will crush it, because I think there's a couple that could. But I know how hard these jobs are, and I know how hard it is to, uh, to do them and how mentally tough you need to be. And I'm telling you, some of these guys are ill-equipped and don't have the skill set necessary to take the next step. And they're going to fall a year from now when we're talking about how did this organization get it wrong again? Just remember this conversation, Ross. Like, if you don't change your process and you lean on the same people, you're going to get the same exact result. Last question, Mike. Um, you kind of already touched on it, but qualities in a head coach that you think are really important? Scaling leadership, holding people accountable. Well, hold on a second. Being, what does that mean? Scaling leadership. It, it, it means that you're going from being able to scheme up somebody or being able to identify this person as the best. You're great in the red zone. You know how to get the guy in the slot open against zone or man. But now all of a sudden, the most important part of your day may be what happens when um, your backup quarterback's girlfriend gets sick. And now all of a sudden, you don't know who your backup quarterback is going to be or your long snapper, you know, throws up in pregame. And are you diligent and organized to know, like, what's going to happen? Or, you know, the, the beat reporter rips you with an anonymous source in your own building. Like, that's really what the job is. And then the owner comes in after the game and he was talking to somebody in the suite and wants to know why you didn't run this play. That's really what it's like to be a head coach. <laughs> and there's no, like, that's, that's the job. And you either have rare mental toughness and the ability to scale leadership and create the right culture, or, you know, every two years, you're looking for the next guy. Um, and the organizations that understand like great alignment um, and do it right, have such a massive advantage over the teams that, that, that don't. 
Check him out on social media at Real Tannenbaum. If you go to Mike Tannenbaum, it looks like he's an investor in equities and equity options. <laughs> Mike Tannenbaum 3 is a retired educator and skier. You want to get to at Real Tannenbaum. That's the one. He's all over ESPN as well as the 33rd NFL team, which is very cool. Thank you so much, Mike. All right, Ross, really appreciate you having me. And I'm going to send you a book report on Chat Chatlos's article. So please make sure you read it. <laughs> Sounds good, man. There right. he is. Thanks, Mike Ross. Tannenbaum. See you, man. Uh, awesome job from Mike. You know what else is an awesome job? What they're doing for you guys at Warby Parker. They are committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses eye exams, and contact lenses. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. I'm going to put on my glasses for the rest of this read. These are my blue light glasses. I look scholarly, by the way. This is why you guys should check us out on YouTube. I, I like how I look with these things. Anyway, try. I'm wearing my Warby Parker glasses right now. For those of you that are just listening, you don't watch. Try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. Order five pairs of glasses to try at home for free for five days. There's no obligation to buy. Ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash Ross. That is the key. Warbyparker.com slash Ross. Ross. Ducks takes. All right, Ross, let's start with some unfortunate off the field stuff. Brown's defensive tackle Malik McDowell was arrested for exposure and battery while Jaguars defensive end Lorenzi McCray arrested after leading police on a high speed chase. So this is really interesting timing. Uh, the day after we spoke with Jimmy Stewart and, and by the way, I uh, really enjoyed that interview and, and got some tremendous feedback from you guys on the Jimmy Stewart interview, which I really appreciate getting that kind of feedback. That Jimmy's the first guy I thought about when I read this stuff. I mean, Malik McDowell was naked, totally naked, and has a battery charge. That's not normal. Like, something is wrong there. And... I believe Malik has had issues previously. If you go back to college and when he was with the Seahawks. Um, so that would be something you could Google, but he's had other issues. And McCray, I read the report where the, the police said that he was in an altered mental state. Now, maybe that's drugs or something. I don't know. But he had no recollection when he got pulled over later that he had been in a high-speed chase earlier. No recollection. It's scary. I don't know what happened there, but that's scary. Tux takes. Some other news includes the Seahawks firing defensive coordinator Ken Norton Jr. and Dak Prescott apologizing for his comments about the officials after Sunday's game, uh, their loss against the 49ers. It seems like the Seahawks switch out coordinators a lot, doesn't it? I mean, the GM stays, the head coach stays. But it's like Bevel out, Schottenheimer in, Schottenheimer out, uh, Shane Waldron in. Now it's Ken Norton Jr. out. They cycle through a lot of coordinators. I mean, at some point, maybe maybe it's the head coach. Maybe the head coach isn't doing a good job picking the right coordinators. As for Dak Prescott, I really appreciate his apology. You know... One thing that I learned early on and that my wife and I are big on, you're going to make mistakes in life. It happens. How you react to those mistakes is really what matters. Number one, try your darndest to never make the same mistake again. And number two, admit your mistake, own it, apologize for it, and move on. After the game when Dak Prescott said good for the fans that were throwing stuff at the refs, that's unacceptable. 
That's a terrible comment by Dak. He realized it. He issued a statement on social media. I give him a lot of credit for it. A lot of credit for it. There's other people that would they don't like to apologize. They're they're like embarrassed to apologize. So here's the deal. Um, just like I believe admitting what you don't know is a sign of intelligence. Even like when I asked Mike Tannenbaum what he means by scaling leadership, I didn't know what he meant. I wanted to know. I think apologizing is actually a sign of strength. I think a lot of people think it's a sign of weakness. I think it's the exact opposite. I think apologizing is a sign of strength. Anyway, I think another sign of strength is making sure you don't ruin your car upholstery. How about that segue? You like them apples? You can even help maintain your resale value thanks to my friends over at AutoZone. They've got tremendous cleaning products you need to freshen up, but just like seat covers, like something as simple as seat covers is significant. If you need an interior upgrade fast, AutoZone has more ways for you to get it however you want it, like free next day delivery, free same day store pickup. The choice is yours. Make AutoZone your one-stop car interior shop. They carry the best products from the best brands at the right price. Get in the zone. Auto zone. Email time. Ever wanted to ask an NFL player a question? Well, here's, here's your, your chance. chance. It's time to ask Ross. Email address ross at ross tucker.com. You can always hit me up there. For anything, you want me to do a speaking engagement or you want to advertise in the show, whatever, let me know. Or if you just want to get your email question read and responded to on the show, it's very easy. Take advantage of any of our sponsors and email me, ross at rosstucker.com. What do you got, Brian? Today's email from Larry in Newton, Iowa. Hey, Ross, uh, it had to be pretty cool to see yourself on a football card. And in the past, I sent you a card of yourself uh, with the Cowboys. You signed it and sent it back to me. So thank you again for that. My question, what was your favorite team to play for? And if it's not the Cowboys, tell me a short story, please, about something that happened while you were on the Cowboys that the public may not have known. Thanks for your time. Good questions, Larry. Um... So, and you're welcome, by the way. So, my favorite team, I think I've been pretty clear. You know the answer to that, right, Bri? I would say the Buffalo Bills. Buffalo Bills? Yes. My favorite team I played for out of the five was the Buffalo Bills. It's hard to, though, if I'm being frank, it's hard to separate. Was it being a part of that team as opposed to the other teams? Or is it because I started the most games, played the most, made the most money, was there the longest. Those are all major contributors and factors into how you feel about a team, right? That said, um, I just enjoyed the pace of Western New York. I enjoyed that we all hung out together and that it was kind of like college. It felt like a team. The other teams in... in in Washington, guys kind of live all over the place and do their own thing a lot. In you know, with the Patriots, same thing. Some guys are closer to uh, Providence. Some guys are up closer to Boston. So, you know, you're not together all the time. Um, same thing for Dallas, where I just didn't really like the culture with the Cowboys when I was there. So Buffalo's the answer. As for a Cowboys short story, there's a lot, actually. I mean, there's a lot of stories that happen. One I will tell Larry is I was good friends. I was actually ended up being in his wedding um, with Chad Hutchinson, who was the starting quarterback for the Cowboys at the time. And I can remember there were times when I would go out with Chad and his wife, who at the time was just his girlfriend, but they were dating in Dallas. And my girlfriend, who's now my wife, was in New York City. So it would be the three of us. And it was pretty clear that Chad was with Lindsay and that I was with nobody. And I distinctly remember one time where um, a girl had been sort of eyeing me up a lot. 
throughout the evening and I didn't do anything about it. And as I was leaving, she came up to me and said, uh, my daddy would just love it if I could be with a cowboy tonight. And I really didn't know what to say. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, okay, well, I'm heading out. See you later. Um, but in hindsight, I remember thinking how messed up I thought that was, the way she phrased that. And having two daughters now, I'm like horrified. But that's a true story. My daddy would just love if I was with a cowboy at night. Which, I mean, wasn't really, by the way, just, just for any of the ladies out there, didn't really make me feel special. Just made me feel like I happened to be part of the club she was looking to be a part of. It wasn't like, hey, I think you're, I, I like the way you look, or I, you know, I want to talk to you. It was like, my daddy would love if I was a cowboy tonight. I was like, well, I'm sure there's plenty of other guys on the team that uh, would, would be willing to fulfill daddy's request, but it's, it's not going to be me, unfortunately. Um, you got a follow up to that, Brian? You're just smiling over there. Well, you know, I've had that same problem happen to me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's, that's a true story. Uh, shout outs. I think we're done here. Pizza boy brewing, sport of culture, vision comics with an X humanheadnyc.com and steakhousesports.com. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feasts, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, rostucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found. A lot of times on the show, I mentioned DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100Gambler or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, doesn't always, sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in sight 